All countries have a head of state. In Britain, it's the Queen. She's not a ruler, she's a constitutional figurehead. Her face is on every stamp, coin and note. And it's her government, her church and her armed forces. Few monarchies survive in the modern world. She remains on the throne by tradition and popular consent. And the Queen doesn't govern, she reigns. This film will show what it means to sit on a 21st century throne. Every summer, the Queen and her court move to Balmoral, her Scottish retreat. The Queen is on holiday, but the state is not. She can never fully relax. Oh, you're already a bit. Come on! Oh. Oh. The monarch is always in touch with her Prime Minister, and once a year, he comes to stay. Well, right at the moment, we're waiting for the Prime Minister and Mrs. Blair, who are going to come and spend the weekend at Balmoral. Monarchs reign for life, but politicians come and go. This will be the last Balmoral weekend for the Queen's 10th Prime Minister. It's Tony Blair's duty to keep the Queen informed and hers to listen. But this visit is a social one, too. It's been touch and go, and in fact, when, when you were, uh, arrived on D-side, it was actually sort of just raining, and it's just got better. So well, I had faith that this year, like every other year, we would be going to the barbecue. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not disappointed. No, I'm not disappointed. No, if we take you... There's absolutely nothing you can't say to the Queen. I mean, I told her about lots of things in my time. And then I should, I should see the Queen more stay away, but I'll just go like... We're gonna... You know, everything from she being pregnant with Leo through to, you know, major decisions that you take. Because the one thing that you know is that she will never divulge anything to anyone. She is the person, probably more than any other person, that you can have a completely and totally discreet conversation with. And it will never go further. Prime Minister, oh, just mm -hmm. <laughs> You've just been having tea, have you? Yes, I've just had tea with Prince Charles. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. Very good. Uh, the garden's getting very nice, isn't it? It's looking fantastic, the house is nice. Yeah. Thank you. Have you seen the new, the new sort of uh, gazebo and wall? Yeah. It's, it's grown, isn't it? Yeah, not so on a day like this, it's just wonderful. Yeah, but it wasn't like this this, this morning. It's very grey and threatening. But we saw you pass over the Bremer gathering. <laughs> Did you see all of us? <laughs> no, no, we didn't. I think we just sort of... Shot through. I was, I was, I was thinking we, we probably yes, must have passed went, at some point. The two aeroplanes went quite close past in front of us. All right. So we um, thought we were arriving. The, and I gather Mrs. Blair was, was doing Bernardo's yesterday with Sir, Sir Fred Good. Yeah, exactly. Because he also came by helicopters. When the Queen is in London, the meetings are more businesslike. There's a weekly audience between the Prime Minister and, and the Queen. It's actually no real formula to it. It, it lasts about an hour. Um, but you go through the topics of the day, but also range a little bit broader than that. And, and it gives you a chance to have a, a very frank conversation about some of the issues which can be very tricky and very controversial. I mean, the, the Queen will often have a, a list of topics she wants to raise, but it's a very free-flowing discussion. And over the years, as I've got to know her better and she's got to know me better than it's, it's become... Uh, Informal, but 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 very good. We've got quite a short drive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which way you'll go. You may not come over here. We're away, by the way. Yes. Thanks, ma'am. The amazing thing about the Queen is that because Winston Churchill was her first Prime Minister, she has got an absolutely unparalleled amount of experience. I mean, you can sit down and talk to the Queen about the major foreign policy events of the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, 80s, 90s. She's been through it all and she's, she's talked with the prime ministers of the day and she has a very um, shrewd and intuitive sense, I think in any event, about politics with a small p. 
Politics with a big P bring the Queen back to London every autumn. Her standard has not flown over Buckingham Palace since July. The Queen is preparing for the most important fixture in the constitutional calendar, the state opening of Parliament. Once, monarchs ran the country. Now, politicians do. But it's still the Queen who opens Parliament to begin the political year. Her representative at the Palace of Westminster is former General Sir Michael Wilcox, better known as Black Rod. We're all clear of the bed. We are, yeah. His job dates back to the days of royal rule. OK, good, good. Black Rod was the doorkeeper, in other words, keep the undesirables out and keep good order and discipline within. And wheelchairs, do we know how many we've got this year? Um, in 1522, Henry VIII moved out with his family and his court, but he left behind Black Rod and my statutes of 1522 say ye are to keep the doors of the High Court that is called the Parliament. So from 1522, Black Rod has been here. Get rid of that and put the box there. When the Queen opens Parliament, she sits in the House of Lords. But the real power is in the Commons. Black Rod is the go-between. Um, the, the, the Queen s sends her messenger down, and Black Rod is the Queen's messenger. And, and you go down to the commons. Now, what happens when we get down there is the commons will shut the door in the face of the Queen's messenger. And that has become symbolic of the independence of the commons. The slamming of the door is to say, uh, we're the elected parliament, we're the people, well, part of the parliament, uh, we're the ones that have been elected by the people, and we decide who comes in. So he has to go through the ritual of banging on the door. This is the door that gets slammed on me, and that's where I hit it. I like it. Makes a nice n n mark. I, I enjoy it hugely. I always try and get through without them closing it. I speed up without them noticing and see if they shut it in time. Have you succeeded? But, but no, no, very nearly. I very, last year I did. Very, very nearly. And the cries of, shut me down the door. <laughs> you, you actually come to the bar of the house here, and of course the chamber is absolutely crowded. And whoop, going over. Now Dennis Skinner sits there. So you, you stop right alongside him. He turns to one side of the chamber and said, the Queen requests your presence in the other house, and nods. And then he turns to the other side and says the same thing. And I happen to be in the corner seat, and I've been for many years. Labour MP Dennis Skinner is known for heckling before the Queen's speech. And I remember there was a hullabaloo about the Queen uh, taxes. It, it was the issue of, of, the, of the moment. And so when he turned to me and the others on that side, I said, tell us to pay our taxes. Parliamentary ceremony hides centuries of quarrelling and a bloody civil war. The state opening is not a celebration of royal power, but of constitutional compromise which allows the monarch to sit on the throne and an elected government to rule. So Black Rod will lead the elected MPs through to the splendour of the unelected Lords. And we all bow, and then the Queen delivers her speech. But you see the, the effect uh, as you come up. It's, uh, I think it works. I think it's terrific. It really is. You, you notice the two thrones here, and you can tell which one the Queen's. Can you tell? It's, look, look at the feet. You see, you can't, you can't sit higher than the Queen. And hers is a couple of inches higher than the Duke of Edinburgh's. If you look at um, our traditions and our cere ceremonies, provided they have a fundamental you know, reason for them, then something as spectacular as this, something that's been going on for 500 years, strip out anything we might feel looks a bit ridiculous now, but it's a tremendous look back to our history and continuity, and, and you know, it symbolizes what the monarch stands for and her relationship between her, the houses of her parliament. So I, you know, I'm very, very pro it. Historic tensions still exist. Some MPs refuse to take part. My objection is not really about the tradition. I ju take exception to the fact that uh, we are being asked to go to the House of Lords uh, to listen to this address, which has been drawn up by the government of the day. Uh, but it's like giving license to the idea that the aristocracy is important. 
and I refuse to do that. Away from Parliament, the Queen has many other regular constitutional duties as head of state. She is supreme governor of the Church of England and defender of the faith, and is known to be a devout Christian. She takes her role very seriously. But Britain is now a country of many faiths. Whatever the Queen believes herself, a modern head of state must include all major religions and promote understanding between them. Dr. Matubai Shah, Imam Mulana Raza. Today, leaders from nine faiths present the Queen with a special medal in recognition of her efforts to bridge religious divides. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely, isn't it? It is only one this diamond in it. Is it really? There's no other. It's very exciting, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed. It was very kind. I think it's especially important right now. Um, all which has been said in the last three or four years, it, it's yes. become important in the way that we've seen it. Yeah, I mean, it, originally it was, it was just a good idea, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Now, it's, now it really is important. Yes. It's important, some think, because in a society of many faiths, an idea of what it means to be British can be lost. Today, at least, there is a sense of unity. Indeed, constitutionally, she is head of the church, but we are all her subjects. Uh, we live in this country. Britain is our home. And uh, like uh, the Christian community, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, they all consider Her Majesty uh, as queen. And uh, they, they consider Her Majesty the head of all our communities. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you. I had the stroke, so I, yeah. I was on holiday. Good, good strong push. <laughs> The Defender of the Faith is also head of the Defenders. All soldiers swear allegiance to the Queen, even if they must do what the politicians tell them. Um, so you so take... I've taken over the first battalion, and, we and we've moved to Cyprus uh -huh. uh, since we last met them. And the, uh... Here, the Royal Welsh update their Colonel-in-Chief on the regiment's deployment. Yes, we were in Iraq in 2004. 2004, mm. yes. Mm. Sort of... yeah. Well, it all looks as though it's changing a bit, doesn't it? But I don't know. It, doesn't, it, it is doesn't now, know. yes, with the, the announcements of a uh, reduction of, of 50. I don't think it's very much. But... No, and this is something that's, that is clearly agreed by the Iraqis and the, and the Americans. Here's hoping that it, that it works. Let's hope it? so, yes. yes. Mm. So you, you've been commanding them? Well, the Hugh, Hugh's just handed over. Just so I, I've just handed over, uh -huh. ma'am. Uh, and we're sort of busy training to go to Iraq on the 15th of May. That'll be our, our third tour to Iraq. Um, in about six years, or, well, since 2003. It comes around terribly yeah, quickly, doesn't it, I'm afraid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, for most of the soldiers, isn't a problem, because they're, they're right up for it. But there are one or two who are suffering a little bit of Iraq fatigue and would rather go to Afghanistan or somewhere different, for example, <laughs> yes, to give them the choice. A and... different sort of sand. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> different medal. Or... Monarchy is symbolic, above all, of power and the monarch's grandest symbols are kept at the Tower of London. Some of the crown jewels will play a central role at the state opening. They're so precious that when they leave the tower, they must take a secret journey. Only one man can touch them. David Thomas, the crown jeweler. The position of crown jeweler is a personal appointment from the sovereign, and it was first created by Queen Victoria in 1843. Before the ceremony, David brings the imperial state crown to the palace in an unmarked box. The head that wears the crown must be comfortable with its weight, so she'll try it on before the day. First crown was made, first made for Queen Victoria's coronation in 1838. It was remade for George VI's coronation, and it was partially remade for the coronation in 53. When I say partially remade, the head size was made smaller and the arches were lowered to make it more feminine and a lot lighter, because it still weighs two and a half pounds. I mean, you've got the most fantastic collection of stones in here. Right in the front is the second star of Africa, 
The first star is in the scepter with the cross, which is also in the Tower of London. And the Black Prince's ruby right in the front. It isn't a ruby, it's a spinel. It's actually worn by Henry V at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And the four pearls in the centre, three of which were on a necklace belonging to Elizabeth I. I think we have to be satisfied that we do have the, the, finest, the finest stones in the, in the English crown jewels. A day ahead of the Queen's speech, the key players are rehearsing the ceremony. The household cavalry will be lining the royal staircase as the Queen enters Parliament. As you're entering into the corridor tomorrow, okay, remember it's the left foot making the noise, the right foot sliding in. And the same detail when we exit the actual staircase as well. The household cavalry are the only soldiers allowed to draw swords in a royal palace. Edwards, Always, this is quite a, a long um, stand and carry, and they're in full armor, you know, breastplates and everything else. And they're very young soldiers. And every year, one or maybe two gets sort of slightly, you know, overcome and have to be replaced. So they've always got two spare. Bags left and right, turn. Quiet, quiet. In the Buckingham Palace billiard room, David Thomas is checking all the royal regalia for the state opening, including the cap of maintenance. Originally an inner lining for a crown, it symbolizes the monarch's spiritual power. It does represent the sovereign and it's carried before, as with the great sword of state, at all state occasions. This is velvet, red velvet cap, and the gold, gold braid at the top here. And this is, this is ermine. Ermine comes from the winter belly of a stoat. So if we ever uh, need to replace ermine, we've, we've got to go and find a stoat in the winter to get the, the fur from the belly. That's how you get the little black marks. And now it's ready to be carried in the carriage, which goes with the crown and the great sword of state. Here we go. And lovely engraving on there. It, again, it's silver gilt. It, it represents the sovereign's royal authority. And we have the emblems down here of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The other side, if I turn it over, it's the same. It's England, Scotland, and Ireland, and the lion and the unicorn here. Now, Wales is not represented, because Wales being a principality, it doesn't get, um, it doesn't get represented. And uh, being Welsh, it's very difficult for me to accept, but uh, I'll go along with that anyway. <laughs> In her private audience room, the Queen is waiting for the President of Latvia and her family. It's a get-to-know-you exercise. The Queen will soon be visiting the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. The President of Latvia, Your Majesty. During Latvia's days under Soviet rule, President Freiburger lived in Canada, where the Queen is also head of state. Well, you see, I thought it was rather strange for Canadians to have a queen who's living overseas so far away. But uh, as time went by, I realized uh, what it meant and, and the advantages of a monarchy in terms of uh, the monarch being the head of state. I hear you're, you're actually working here, aren't you? Yes, well, based in London. And that's what brings you here sometimes, isn't it? So that you I can't, can't see really. Her. It's, uh, I'm not allowed. And you're not allowed to come <laughs> no, and see her. No, not really. <laughs> because, I, oh, you see, one has as president a rather limited time at one's oh, disposal, yeah, and a lot has to be done in that time, and, and it doesn't leave so much time for private visits as well. She embodies the, uh, the best that monarchy has to offer. Uh, in other words, uh, a person who, as a symbol, of the power of the state, uh, but at the same time it's a human being, uh, and a human being who actually has to work in order to do that. So would you like to come? Thank you. Would you like to sit here? Would you, would you like to sit here? Yeah. All right. 
And she also has a lot of charm and a lot of personality, so that I think with that personality, uh, if she had not been born a queen, uh, she certainly uh, would have won, I think, elections with no difficulties at all. Westminster is rehearsing the state opening of Parliament. The Duchess of Norfolk stands in for the Queen. Four pages, who must all be shorter than the monarch, will carry her train. Friends of the royal family, their reward is a day off school. If you go up onto the top step, because if you hang back, it'll probably have the effect of just pulling back on the Queen's shoulders. Well, can I just go like that? Yes, that's yeah, okay. And then when you lay it down, what you're really after is that it's it's well smooth. Absolutely. It would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. A bit nervous. Yeah. You've done nothing like this before. No. No. <laughs> no. We've got two doing this for the first time, and two veterans who. Absolutely. That's why they're so relaxed at the back. We're waiting for um, for Mr. Straw, but he's not quite here, so we're just going to start without him. Yeah. Despite all the planning. One key player is missing. I can make a telephone call, but I don't know if that's going to achieve anything. Don't achieve anything at all. I presume he knows about exactly. it. Exactly. Does he know? Oh, yes, absolutely. And then you might coming through this side. Yes. No, well, this, this side is better. Yes. Yeah. And then the Queen will sit down and say, My Lords, pray be seated. The House of Lords will sit. And then when she's ready, she will then tell the Lord Great Chamberlain to um, tell Black Rod, who is down there in the central lobby, to get the Commons. There's roughly about a minute wait, because we can't start the speech too early, because the Queen doesn't like speaking when there's a lot of noise still going on. We then start the speech, and I quietly say to the Lord Chancellor, go. As Lord Chancellor, Charles Falconer is Britain's most senior lawyer. And Charlie, the longer you take, the better, because it, um, it fills in time. <laughs> It'll be his job to present the speech, written by the government, for the Queen to read. And Charlie, actually, sorry, just one... one <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for me personally, it's the most nerve-wracking event you could possibly imagine. If you're making a speech or, or discussing some uh, political issue, you know, you can sort of correct your words. But here, the eyes of the world are upon you, and it's a really nerve-wracking occasion. <laughs> like that. Do you see what I mean? Brilliant. This, I carry this great purse, and this great purse has got one bit where the speech goes in and will be held in, but if you put it in another bit, it slips straight through. So you're convinced as you open the purse, you will find nothing there except a dry cleaning ticket. That's happened every time, every time <laughs> in your life. It is the best man at the wedding syndrome where you can't find the ring. And I don't know what happens. Do you say, right, we'll just cancel this year's legislative programme? I'm afraid we lost the speech, and that was it. So you feel everything depends on it. Yeah. Well, well, Sue has his offering to come and give you lessons. <laughs> <laughs> In effect, there should be Lord Chancellor, you... Jack Straw, leader of the Commons, is 30 minutes late. Okay. Okay. We, we have to slightly improvise how we all get in, okay. and then as she passes, we just bow. Okay. Okay. Right. Do you see what I mean? Because she's behind us. She's going to go on into the roving room. Yeah. But we sort of stop here. Okay. And I'm sorry we started without you, but no, it's fine. I'm all, sorry I was late. But you're waiting to process that way. See what I mean? Lady Heyman, the new Lord Speaker, is a novice. <laughs> I know, I know exactly what we're doing. I look after you. Sorry. On the day, everyone's in uniform and it all works beautifully. Trust right. me. No, I'm just worried about the room. I'm yeah. worried about oh, yeah. stairs and the room. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I can yeah. Jack can hold you. If you've got a moment, if you, if you can have a... We can be on Well, the, the first thing is, if you get a perfect rehearsal, you get a disastrous performance. So we don't mind if, if some things seem a bit frayed at the end. No, well, you can see how complex it is. If you've got any questions, do come and ask them. Um, but rehearsal over. Uh, I'm sure tomorrow will go extremely well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. The state opening is a public spectacle too. The Queen's horses and carriages will form two processions through the streets, one for the crown jewels and one for the Queen. Long before dawn on the big day, the Royal Muse is hard at work. Yesterday we started at half past two. Today it was more between four and half past. We've just taken the horses out for exercise first to make sure that they're a little bit tired because obviously there's a lot going on. 
So just try and take the edge off of them before. I'm an outrider for the Crown, so I'll be running a bay horse today. I'll put on the Crown procession, which is quite nice because we actually leave the whole thing out because we got for the Queen. So I might have done a state opening before. Such an amazing feeling when you're riding out, you know, up the Mall or across horse guards with the crowds. It's just unbelievable. You just ride out and there's just everybody there. I mean, you just got these, you get little like, butterflies in your stomach, it's a little knot, and it's just an amazing feeling. You're like, I can't believe I'm actually doing this for the Queen. It's just a bit surreal, really. And then you come back and you're like, did that really happen? <laughs> Was I really there? <laughs> it's amazing. Every member of this mounted cast has a special costume called the full state livery. Thank you, sir. Alex Mattinson is in charge of the wardrobe. There you go, Jack. Hey, Vicky. How are you doing? The jackets over on the other side are worth you know, roughly about ten to 15,000. Pretty much most of the uniforms are over 100 years old, so we're still using them even to this day because they're only used once a year. Then they, they, we pretty much get quite a lot of life out of it. So a lot of the britches actually have names in from 1901 and things like that. We come to the age the thing, really, whereby if you don't fit the uniform, you don't really do the job sometimes because then we have to try and find someone else. I've never actually yet said, I'm afraid I can't get you into this. Um, you just probably won't look as good as some of the others. That's the only thing. There's always a few nerves before you go out, just that, you know, your horses are going to be good and everything, but they went well on the rehearsal yesterday, so it should all be fine. The Imperial State Crown, the Cap of Maintenance and the Sword of State represent the powers of the Sovereign and travel to Westminster ahead of the Queen. I'm with the carriage over there, which is the Alexandra state coach, I think, with the crown in. to today on Radio 4 with James Nochte and Sarah Montague. Today marks the start of the final session of Parliament with Tony Blair as Prime Minister. It'll be officially opened by the Queen. Speaking in the House of Lords, she'll outline the planned programme of legislation. And by the time of the next Queen's speech, Mr Blair will have stood down. From Westminster, our political correspondent, Laura Kunzberg. Like much of his administration's previous legislation, the speech will concentrate on law and order. Expect measures to tighten the rules on immigration, create more secure borders and longer sentences for violent offenders. The Prime Minister may have a minor role on the parliamentary stage today, but it is he who has written the speech. I have always thought that the monarchy has a unifying role to play. And when we put on you know, that wonderful ceremony of the state opening of Parliament, personally, I think that's great. I think people love to see it. They know it's a ceremony. They're not seriously thinking the Queen's you know, sat down and written out the Queen's speech herself. They know, of, uh, of course, that it's a piece of pomp and ceremony. But what's wrong with that? She arrives at the royal gate, which is at the bottom of the stairs. She's greeted warmly, climbs to the top of the stairs, then goes into the royal dressing room, and I think between five and ten minutes go by. The doors open, and the most important person in the realm is revealed, and yet the most important person in the realm is a constitutional monarch. It is the state in all its absolutely stunning pomp. It is utterly and totally illustrative of everybody's place in the Constitution. The judges, respectful and in order, the bishops, suitably spiritual, everybody in their place. 
She summons the commons, but it is those very commons that she has summoned who, by producing the government, have required her to read that speech. Close the door. The elected deliver their symbolic, historic snub to the unelected. Mr. Speaker, the Queen commands this Honourable House to attend Her Majesty immediately in the House of Peers. Have you got Helen Mirren on standby? <laughs> the Commons shamble along from the House of Commons chamber, making a huge noise indicating that for all your grandeur and for all your pomp in the House of Lords, we are the people who make the noise and we are the people who matter. I hand over on behalf of the government the speech and then she reads out what it is that her government is going to do. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, my government will pursue policies aimed at meeting the challenges which the United Kingdom faces at home and abroad. A stable economy is the foundation of a fair and prosperous society. My government will continue to maintain low inflation, sound public finances and high employment. The crown jewels are back in the tower, but the constitutional role continues all year round. The Queen will soon appoint her 11th Prime Minister. For now, Gordon Brown is still Chancellor. On the eve of his last budget speech, he comes to share the contents with the monarch. The Queen removes the corgis for the occasion. I'll shut the dogs up, man. Oh, good man. <laughs> I think wise. It's meant to be an opportunity for her to give advice, as well as to listen. Well, what I do every year is report to the Queen uh, the night before the budget, and uh, I go through all the uh, major details, and she asks questions about what's happening, not just in Britain, but around the world. But what, obviously, uh, she'll be interested in and is interested in is the welfare of our armed forces. You know, just about every member of her family has served the country in one way or another. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Your Majesty. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Thank you very much for meeting me today. Well, like I said, you, it's come round again awfully quickly, though, hasn't it? It has, indeed. <laughs> and uh, I have got some good information for you, and I've also got something to tell you about how we're trying to support the troops in Afghanistan oh, and right. Iraq. So good. Oh. I know there's a family interest as well, because of the... Well, exactly, because Harry is... Well, I think he's a very brave young man and uh, very courageous, and uh, we'll certainly do everything we can to, to support him. But uh, I, I, thought, I thought I would say that um, the first thing I'll do in the budget is put more money for our troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and also for all the other places around the world where they're doing such a good job as yes, well. Yes, because they're, they're very pushed all around, aren't they, now, with so yeah, many places. Yeah. So we would, we would put extra money mm -hmm. into that. And I, I was in Basra, and I thought that the morale was very high. And I thought that uh, very young, but doing a great job, and very determined and enthusiastic. Yes. And the, I mean, I saw the Royal Welsh the other day, and, and they've got a lot of Black Watch who volunteer to go with them. That's but, right. You know, people are, are keen to go. I'm hoping to go to Afghanistan in the next uh, few days after the budget to see. Oh, are you? Yeah, to see how... Yes, <laughs> because Anne went, went She out. did, and yes. uh, that was a very good thing to do. And uh, I think these visits do help the morale mm -hmm. of the... And I think Anne was just been in Iraq. Yes, she, well, she does a wonderful job doing <laughs> and so do, the, so do all of you. And Andrew, Andrew went to look at the helicopters, because that's, yes. that's his favourite. Yeah. <laughs> I think when you start coming to talk about the budget, you, you feel that uh, you've got to present all the formal parts of the, the budget in, in order and in some, some detail. And I think you quickly realise 
that what the Queen wants to know is what are the central things, and she wants to talk about what's happening to all the different industries and places she's visited. And she's both sympathetic and uh, very helpful to you, and at the same time, uh, she's got very good advice about some of the issues that are worrying people at the time. And I think uh, even though it's the last stage of a budget process, sometimes you go back and change a bit of your speech. It's not just the political bigwigs who have private meetings with the Queen. Every year, beyond the public gaze, hundreds of audiences take place. The Queen meets diplomats, clergy, heads of state. I will stand on the left and walk in first. The door will open. Um, and if the president is on my right, and we'll walk in two, two, two paces or so and stop, and I will announce um, the president of Estonia and Dr. Rutel. I have this pronounced correct. <laughs> yes, good. It was very good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> president of Estonia and Dr. Rutel, Your Majesty. For the monarch, it's an unchanging round, but if she's bored, it never shows. The ambassador of Poland, Your Majesty. Whoever the guest, the format is the same. Your Majesty. Okay. A Lord Chamberlain arrives. This is your badge of office. Well, I've, I've heard all about it. You wear it in a very strange place, but otherwise it's all right. Um, dare I ask where? <laughs> you wear it here. I wear it on my back, back yeah. yes. yes. A Dean of St Paul's retires. Well, it's, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be able to give her the, the KCVO as a token of thanks and appreciation. Very much indeed. How, how long have you been in Scotland? You've been... After 55 years, the Queen's conversational repertoire is finely tuned. Is it? Is it like what you expected it to be like? <laughs> is this your first visit here to Scotland? Is it like what you thought it was going to be like? So at the end of the meeting, the Queen presses a discreet buzzer and the doors are open. As head of state, the Queen has visited most countries on Earth at least once. But even after half a century, she's still covering new ground. The first state visit by a British monarch will be a milestone for the newly democratic Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, which will be the last stop. For the British ambassador, Nigel Haywood, this will be one of the high points of a 27-year career in the Foreign Office. We really are in the most pro-British country I've ever been to in my life. I've been to quite a lot of countries. Estonia will be the 132nd nation the Queen has visited. And it's hoped thousands will greet her here in the capital, Tallinn, before a concert in this square. Louise, the ambassador's wife, keeps an eye on the planning. We're in the town hall square now, and they're looking at where the Queen is actually going to sit uh, when she looks at the concert, which is the platform over there, they're going to put on a sort of platform where people are going to sing at her. And they're busy discussing whether I think she's actually going to get on the platform, get off the platform, and where she's going to sit in relation to the platform. To get your head of state out to a post that you're in must be every ambassador's dream. We know it's a lot of work and everything like that, but ah, just to have her here. <gasps> oh, and we never thought we would. We just didn't think. The request was sent in. Please, could she consider coming to Estonia? And we just didn't think that she'd be here when we were here, so we are so lucky. The Queen's visit is fast approaching. Nigel has asked the Royal Navy to stage the last engagement here in Tallinn Harbour. What we have to do is make the absolute best possible display that we can. If you think of the most over-the-top, jubilant, all-happening thing that you can come up with, then you'll be halfway to what we want to achieve on this. This really has to be a brilliant send-off. And as I said to my staff this morning, keep smiling. One of the huge problems of diplomacy is that it's very difficult to quantify the impact you have on political situations or bilateral relations. Um, what, of course, we do benefit from is, is the general sense of pro-Britishness and goodwill that, that the visit will engender.
HMS Liverpool is not here just because the Lord High Admiral is coming to town. Estonia is a new NATO ally and has just bought three British mine hunters. The Queen will mark the deal on board this Royal Navy destroyer. Louise is her stand-in at the rehearsal. I genuinely don't know why foreigners should be interested in our Queen. I have no idea, but in every country we've been in, that's been the sole topic of conversation that people have really wanted to know about. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Commander Henry Duffy, Captain of h Very nice to meet you, Commander. Absolutely delighted. You know, they're sort of interested in our Prime Minister. The one thing they want to know is, what's our Queen doing? Oh, what's her family doing? Oh, you must know, because you come from Britain. Admiral, you need to chit-chat with the Queen here now. Sorry? You're going to have to talk, talk to the Queen. Talk, talk, Keep queen. talk. Small well, talk. It would probably what, focus what, change. I'll talk about her dog. How are her dogs? No, Is somebody not, not looking Louise, at her Louise, stop getting dogs. surreal. Oh, sorry, the, no. <laughs> the, the focus then changes <laughs> to, to the... the as far as I know, I just wander around after them all and introduce people if they need to be introduced. And I just hope I remember all the names. The Queen wants to point out puddles. Yeah, I think, she won't want to step I, I think you can rely on Commander Duffy to have removed every puddle. If she, she can't see the, the fly pass, she'll need to step out like that. Yeah, yeah, so. because, I mean, there's two things. One, you can't see the fly pass, and two, she should be standing here. Uh, Nigel's starting to get butterflies now. It's only because once the actual visit starts, there is nothing he can do because he will actually be with the Queen the whole time. I keep saying, yeah, it'll be fine on the night, it'll be OK, but um, he'll still worry about it, and he'll worry about it right to the end. Your Majesty. <laughs> This is uh, quite an interesting corridor. It has um, uh, a few pictures of, um, again, fat royal family occasions. Penny Russell Smith, the Queen's press secretary, has invited the Estonian media to the palace. The Queen is more proactive than ever with her public relations, and it's hoped the visit will be one of the biggest stories in Estonia for years. There aren't many countries now where the Queen has not been, actually. So um, she'll be delighted to, to, to come and see Estonia for herself. She really will. Penny wants to make sure that everyone understands the Queen's role as head of state. Does the government play plays a role in, in organising some agenda topics, what to discuss? Right. Because the Queen is not an executive head of state, there won't be substantive political talks. But as you may have been told, there will be the very important ceremonial element of it with the welcome and, and, uh, and dinner. How it was decided that the Queen will go to Baltic States? You said yes. that she's not uh, doing it herself. No, the British government will have advised her, and obviously, since we are now, um, you know, partners in the European Union and, and NATO, um, obviously the British government decided that it would be very appropriate. Mm. Anything else? Our president was in an official visit recently in Scotland. Yes, indeed. And, and, and they met. So yes. Are you able to, to like, uh, recollect any any of her impressions of the meeting or are you able to co comment <laughs> <laughs> you're digging away aren't you um, it's very hard for me to say I simply don't know what was discussed Ian hi it's Tim I'm returning your call on... whether it's the Baltic or Blackpool the Queen's movements are all planned here at the palace's travel office so it should be okay We've proposed to the private secretary that she could fly out in a helicopter from Hollywood. Former fighter pilot group captain Tim Hewlett is in charge of royal transport. Um, so Paul F. Gray would come out with the Queen and you would cover both the Queen and Prince Philip for the day. Um, I'm responsible for all aspects of air travel that all 12 members of the royal family carry out. In looking at the whole of the Baltic States visit, we have three countries in five days, which is quite challenging. Not a huge choice of aeroplanes um, in which to do this. The Queen doesn't have her own aircraft um, at all, other than the Queen's helicopter. So we've um, looked at and priced a British Airways aircraft f for the task. 
Hiring the plane for the five-day trip will cost £70,000. British Airways hand-pick the crew. But Tim still insists on a pre-flight briefing. They will be apprehensive, so part of my job is to reassure them that, um, that they're there really to do what they do best. Good afternoon all, ladies and gentlemen. As Bob said, this is a private charter for the palace um, for a state visit for Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh to go to the Baltic States. You'll find that the first and third rows will be taken out on the front right-hand side of the aircraft. That is where the Queen um, and the Duke of Edinburgh will be sitting, and by taking out every other row, um, that just allows them a little bit more sort of leg space. Let's just come on to the cabin staff side. Nettie, I know you've done this before, and it's super to see you again. Remember how to mix a gin and Dubonnet, Nettie? 70-30. It's <laughs> 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 <That's> my girl. <laughs> and some bitter for the Duke. Used to be double diamond, but I think they've gone out of business now. Um, newspapers, periodicals, a good selection of everything, including the Racing Post, please. No, we've mentioned that to Adrian already. <laughs> Absolutely essential reading, so if we can make a point of, um, of having the racing post amongst a cross-section of um, tabloids and uh, broadsheets. Corgi, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could do that. I was privileged to go to collect the Queen Monday, and we flew down with um, 20 passengers and 10 dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if those dogs had air miles, I tell you, they'd be, uh, they've logged up quite a few in the time. So, but in the cabin, it's business as usual. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you, Tim. After a year's planning, the Queen finally reaches Estonia on the last leg of her Baltic tour. She's greeted by the British Embassy team before heading off to the customary state welcome from the President. At the state banqueting house, manager Peter Knoll is fine-tuning what should be the grandest dinner in modern Estonian history. Table number three. This, this one chair is completely wobbly. And uh, since the food is going to be placed, Ronaldo, on the table, we have to move the glasses and the napkins slightly back, otherwise you have problems. Foreign Affairs Department has just arrived, so we can soon get the table plan as well, so we know who is sitting where. It looks good so far. We had been doing about six and a half hours of ironing of seat covers and then another two hours of the tablecloths because there's 12 tablecloths in here, another 10 tablecloths over in the um, Olaf Saal where the reception will be, the receiving line. So it's quite a lot of tasks which had to be done this morning. We started already 9 o'clock and the Queen arrives at 8.30 this evening. Estonia is known for, we get everything done, but it's done last minute. Today, we were at 4.30, ready with everything for something which is starting at 7.30. So this is actually a record probably, but in a positive way. In the, in the main room behind the flowers, we're hiding a tissue box for the Queen, just in case she sneezes. <laughs> the guests are all in place for the ambassador's reception. If, as they come to the bottom of the steps, you feel moved to spontaneous applause, that's fine. who was the inventor of the Philharmonic Chamber Choir. The Queen and Prince Philip have 45 minutes to meet Nigel's 200 guests. Philippa Silas is the foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister. Her husband is in Afghanistan. So... Is he? Do you hear from him every day? He's got a paper, an email. Yes. 
customised basically. <laughs> the introductions are taking longer than planned. One of the Queen's private secretaries has a word with Nigel. As the Queen's host, the ambassador should make sure she keeps to the schedule. What should, should I say to her, actually? The time has come. Yeah, the time has come. We were just checking the clock. Um, I think we're probably overrun slightly, but uh, everyone's enjoying it. We just have to gently move Her Majesty on so that she's not late for the next appointment. How do you do that? Um, I don't know, but you're about to discover. Until someone intervenes, the Queen will just go on meeting, greeting, and thinking up questions. We're seconds to go. I think we probably need to give up. At the moment, the door to the service room is open. This is actually our um, standard team of four people in our restaurant. And uh, in order to make a decision who was going to serve the Queen and who was going to serve the President, we made this morning a small lottery. So until this morning, nobody of them knew who was going to serve it. So they're not getting too nervous overnight. Queen will be Robert, uh, and uh, the President will be Oliver. Peter thinks of everything, even the choreography of the microphones. Um, not good, not good. If I would be sitting here and have two persons coming at the same time, I, I would be claustrophobic. So I think that Ilves speaks first, so we will bring first to Ilves the microphone and then to the Queen, but behind each other, not at the same time, but within a flow. So it's not that you wait until she speaks. This is it. This is my Estonian creation. Well, this is very state banquet. The Queen, I know, will come with all her glitzy bits, but, but apparently we were told tiaras are not required for those who, are, who don't have them. Just as well. Because <laughs> I do not. <laughs> because I've never been to a state banquet before, that will be really, really exciting. And it'll probably be the only one I'll ever get to go to. Often if we go to important dinners, you're sort of sitting with important people, but now we're sitting with really important people. And it'll be interesting to see how the conversation goes, really. So I'm sort of quite looking forward to that bit. <laughs> For the state banquet, the Queen is wearing the Grand Duchess Vladimir tiara. It was smuggled out of Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution. She and Estonia's new president, Tomas Ilves, wear the honors they exchanged earlier. For the Queen, the Blue Order of Terra Mariana. For the President, the Order of the Bath. The Herr Nigel Hayward. As Nigel and Louise met the monarch earlier, Protocol dictates that they don't shake hands with her again, but all the other 92 guests must be formally introduced. You have spoken about the historic ties between the United Kingdom and Estonia. Our shared history, particularly during Estonia's struggle for independence, is something that we will never forget. Join me in a toast to the President and the people of the Republic of Estonia. Hi, 
<laughs> very good, thank you very much. I only managed to knock over a chair. <laughs> It was a uh, trifle embarrassing, but there we go. Oh, dear. The final day of the state visit starts with the largest event of the entire Baltic tour, the walkabout and concert. Tallinn Old Town Square is packed. Is that wire going to be on the ground when the Queen arrives? Yeah. As Queen's press secretary, Penny Russell-Smith tries to keep the media happy without crowding the Queen. A practical solution is to let one camera film at close quarters and then share the results. But Estonian security is tight. The trick in filming the Queen is to try and stay ahead of her all, all the time. Um, the problem is that you're often being pushed by uh, local security, by palace security. You clearly don't want to get um, too close to the Queen anyway. But when the Queen arrives, Penny finds that she too is a target of Estonian security. Paul, we're too close. No, Paul, Paul, Esgrave, is this security guy's causing the problem because they're getting too tight. Too tight. Too tight. Can he go? He, he's causing the problem. Hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Queen's, Queen's cameraman. Queen's cameraman. Queen's cameraman. What are you doing? Yes, we know that. We know that. Stop pushing me. How dare you? That was quite vicious. Things are more orderly on board HMS Liverpool. Yeah. So, and then I'll say, Your Majesty, would you, could I ask you to, uh, to sign a visitor's book? Yes, OK, she sits down. I'll then step back, cos I've got to stay out your way. The tour ends with the Queen and President Ilves celebrating UK-Estonian military links. Here, on one of her ships, she meets Estonian troops who have served with British forces in Afghanistan. I am quite proud, actually. I think we've done well here. You know, it's really good. Everyone's enjoyed themselves, absolutely. The Royal Party have enjoyed themselves. People have been saying they're coming back again. <gasps> you, know, you know, then, it's, got, it's gone well, and everyone's had a happy time. Ma'am, it's been wonderful. I'm only sorry it's over. Thank you so much for coming. For the ambassador, it's been a diplomatic triumph. It's been such a, a great day. The trouble is, there have been about three occasions where I've nearly burst into tears, which is a bit embarrassing. It's a huge historic moment, and everyone's going to be talking about it for the rest of, of, of my time here and probably for, for my successors' times here. The Queen is special. She's the brand leader. This is the person everyone thinks of when, when they think of monarchy. They're asking whether it would be all right to present the garlands at the beginning. Oh, yes, I think that's all right. And they... I can get it over my hat. She asked me if I was covered in lard. It was lard. lard. But it's, that's not, it's not as much fun as you think. <laughs> <laughs>